This is Kim Newlove, host of the Pharmacist Voice podcast. Thank you for joining me for episode 105. If you're new to the show, welcome. I alternate solo shows and interview shows. The solo shows are about my career change from pharmacist to voice actor. I have been an Ohio licensed pharmacist for 20 years, but I'm no longer in clinical practice. Instead, I provide voiceover and narration services. My specialties include medical narration, e-learning, explainer videos, and audiobook narration. If you have a project in mind or you want to listen to my medical narration demo, you can do both at my website, thepharmacistvoice.com. I also have an online course called Pronounce Drug Names Like a Pro, which you can find at kimnewlove.com. Pronouncing drug names can be hard. Drug names can't be sounded out like normal words. When you come across a drug name that you don't know, how do you find the correct pronunciation? You need to know how to break it down, which syllables to emphasize, and more. For example, selmeterol looks like selmeterol. The correct pronunciation is selmeterol. That one seems easy, but if you sound it out, you might guess the wrong pronunciation. If you don't know how to find the correct pronunciations and break them down so you can use them correctly and with confidence, Pronounce Drug Names Like a Pro is for you. Buy the course online today at kimnewlove.com. My podcast interview shows feature a variety of people who use their voices to advocate for something, educate in some way, or entertain. Today's episode is an interview with Nancy Gettle Syed. I invited her to be on the podcast for two reasons. Number one, Nancy is a foreign pharmacy school graduate who became a U.S. pharmacist. I want her to share her story so you can hear how passion and perseverance helped her achieve her personal goal of becoming a U.S. pharmacist. And number two, I also invited Nancy to be on the podcast to share how she uses her voice as a community pharmacist, certified pharmacogenomics consultant pharmacist, and podcast host so that you can be inspired by her interesting career path. Let me tell you a little bit more about my guest, then we'll dive right into our interview. Nancy Gettle Syed earned her Bachelor of Science degree in pharmacy from the University of Cairo in Egypt in 2005. She has multiple certifications, including Certified Pharmacogenomics Consultant Pharmacist and Certified APHA Immunizer. As the pharmacist in charge at her Walmart pharmacy in Texas, Nancy loves helping her patients and is a passionate preceptor who equips pharmacy students with the tools and knowledge they need to be successful upon graduation. Nancy founded Texas Pharmacogenomics Consulting, LLC, in 2020 and enjoys entrepreneurship. Stay tuned later this year for Nancy's debut as a podcast host on the PGX for Pharmacists podcast, which is part of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. To learn more about Nancy, Texas Pharmacogenomics Consulting, and the PGX for Pharmacists podcast, please visit the show notes, which you can find on your favorite podcast app or at thepharmacistvoice.com. Without further ado, here's my interview with Nancy Gettle Syed. Hi, Nancy. Welcome to the Pharmacist Voice podcast. How are you? Hi, Kim. I'm doing good. Your interview today is going to kind of be a follow-up to episode 97 of the Pharmacist Voice podcast. It was an interview with Maureen Garrity from NABP about how a foreign pharmacy grad can become a U.S. pharmacist, and you have done just that. I think your passion for becoming a U.S. pharmacist and your perseverance in actually doing it makes you the best guest to share your story. Can you tell me a little bit about how you went from a University of Cairo grad to a U.S. pharmacist? Yes. So I graduated from the University of Cairo in 2005. Um, Right before I graduated and through my entire pharmacy school, I've been dreaming of becoming a U.S. pharmacist. 
So I started getting the studying materials back home. I started reading and educating myself on the different strategies and the different uh, topics that American pharmacists here, you know, study at school. Uh, once I graduated from Cairo University, uh, I booked my exam here with the NABP. And um, I took my FPGEE test in June of 2007. Uh, I got my passing results in August of 2007. And I passed first trial. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I then had to uh, pass a TOEFL IBT test. I passed that in May of 2008. Can you just remind my listeners what the TOEFL is? It is the test of English fluency language, I believe. Or is it English as a foreign language, maybe? Yes, you're right. And then the IBT stands for Internet Based Testing. Okay. And you passed that the first time, too, right? Yes. All right, way to go. Yeah, I've always loved English back uh, in high school. It was the second language that I chose, and I found it a uh, very intriguing language. So I started uh, watching some English shows on my weekends when my mom would allow me to do so. I've always heard that people learn English as a second language from television. That's fascinating. Thanks for sharing that. That's cool. Yes, it was super cool for me. Uh, I can't tell you, like me talking to you about this now is taking me back and bringing some memories on how fun that was for me. You know, and I'm sitting there waiting for the TV to be turned on so I can watch those certain shows and uh, turn the encryption on so I can listen and read and understand. Oh, the subtitles. Yeah. Yes. Now tell me one TV show that you watched that helped you learn English. I'm just curious. Yeah, there was that one show. I have it in my mind right now. I just can't recall the name. It's, uh, oh, Dr. Phil. Mm, mm -hmm. Yes. The talk show. Perfect. I loved his shows. He was very clear in his talks. You can clearly understand his English. It was, to me, it was proper English. I loved it. I loved his show. And uh, there were some other fantasy shows that I can't really recall, but I love Dr. Phil. Thank you for sharing that. And look at that. He helped you pass the TOEFL IBT. Check it out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, going back to what I had to do when I came to the States, after I passed the TOEFL IBT, um, I was living in the state of New Jersey at the time. So I had to take their... Uh, law exam, which is the MPJE, and uh, the NAPLEX. I passed those two first trial, and I got my New Jersey pharmacist license in September of 2011. Congratulations. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I didn't use it much because the market was tough for me as a foreign graduate, uh, practiced in New Jersey for, I would say, a year. Um, I did work prior to getting my license, you know, within that time frame from passing my exams and waiting for my license. I was working as a technician in certain places. Didn't you uh, have to complete a certain number of internship hours in order to get your license? Was it 2,000 or how many was it? It was 2,000. Okay. Yes. That's plenty. Um, it is plenty, more than plenty. Uh, and that's that That was the struggle I had. If you uh, notice, there is a gap between when I passed the TOEFL IBT in 2008 and when I got my license in 2011. It was all because of the internship hours. Hmm. I wasn't able to find an employer that would hire me and take me on to do my internship hours because I was a foreign graduate. So I struggled. It was not easy. I'm sorry you struggled. Thank you. And weren't you having your children, starting your family around that time as well? Yes, I had my first baby girl in July of 2008. Sorry, I had to <laughs> think back. 
at the numbers. It's been a while, 13 years. She'll be 13 no. on the 11th of July. Oh, all right. My birthday is July 12th. July is a great month for birthdays. Of course. Well, happy mm-hmm. early birthday for you. Well, thanks. And happy early birthday to your daughter. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. So 2008, you passed the TOEFL IBT. 2011, you finally are able to get the NAPLEX and the MPJE because it took you so long with having to complete these intern hours and life gets in the way. So what then? Then uh, when the market was tough in New Jersey for me to find a decent pharmacist job with my license, uh, I decided to just pursue other states. Um, I did some research and I just got drawn to the state of Texas for some reason. I couldn't tell you why, Um, but I got their law book. I studied, I took the exam, I passed, and I got my Texas licensed pharmacist in August of 2012. Um, I applied for a job in Texas And I got a job offer within a month of applying. So I decided to move to Texas. And I've been here since then. It was a big change. Having lived in New Jersey for five years, and that was my very first, um, you know, state to be uh, at, having been, you know, moving from Egypt and... uh, being new to the States. So it was a big jump moving from New Jersey to Texas, but I love it. Now, what was that like relocating from New Jersey to Texas with then, did you have all three of your girls at that point? No, I only had my first girl. Uh, I uh, conceived my two other girls here in Texas. They were born here. Uh, My second baby, uh, she was born in March of 2013. And the baby baby, the little one, (laughs) uh, she was my Christmas gift, uh, well, December of 2014. Okay. Yeah. And they both went through a lot. Well, all three of them really went through a lot with me during their pregnancy uh, because I had all that stress of studying, trying to get my internship hours, trying to get my license and... Uh, with the two little ones being here as a newly licensed Texas pharmacist with the stress of big corporate. So uh, they did go through a lot with me and uh, I love them dearly for that. Being uh, a pregnant mama working 12 hour shift with no meal. It was bad. It was rough. So that working while pregnant is tough in a pharmacy, right? Yes. And being on your feet for 12 hours. It was tough. And I worked until the last month of my pregnancy. I think we pharmacists who work while pregnant kind of deserve special recognition for it. Like it's a hazardous environment almost. You're on your feet, like you said, and you don't necessarily get official breaks. You don't get to sit and you're among the sick all the time. I couldn't agree more. I recognize you for your struggle and uh, coming through with three healthy girls. Way to go. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And my heart goes out for all pregnant women, pharmacist women out there that have to work 12-hour shifts, being on their feet in retail. Uh, It's tough. It's not easy. So I commend them for doing it. Well, once you got to Texas, you're licensed, you've been working for a while, you are a pharmacist. And then what happens after that? You become pharmacy manager, right? So the retail um, company uh, that I initially got the job offer with here in Texas, um, I worked with them for six months and then they promoted me to a pharmacy manager at that location. Um, I worked with them for two years But honestly and truly, I've always wanted to join a certain retail company, but I wasn't able to find that in New Jersey. And the opportunity presented itself here in Texas. That retail company was building a new store in the town I was working in. So I applied and I got the position for the pharmacy manager for that store. So I joined their team in February of 2014. And I have been with them since then. 
Uh, I enjoyed building the business from the ground up. And when I talk about building it from the ground up, I'm not talking about the outside building. I'm talking about um, doctors detailing, um, you know, acquiring customers and retaining them, um, setting up metrics, uh, keeping the metrics right, which I know a lot of us don't like to talk about metrics, but that comes with big corporations. Uh, making the pharmacy profitable, uh, building a team, hiring people, start with them from scratch, uh, mentoring them and training them. It's been rewarding. It, it's ex- it was exhausting. It was challenging at first, but I am a girl that likes a good challenge. So <laughs> I took on the challenge and I'm glad I did because I learned a lot through the years I've been with the company. It was a great learning experience. Well, congratulations on making that transition from staff to manager and walking into a brand new store with no medicine on the shelves, stocking that, filling positions, training people, and building a team. You deserve recognition for that, too. I think that's awesome. You're so kind. Thank you. (laughs) You are welcome. You're welcome. I know it's not easy. I worked for Walgreens for a number of years, and I know you don't work for Walgreens, but I remember they had a plan back in 2002. I think they wanted a certain number of pharmacies by a certain year. And every time they had built a new one, it was pretty cool. You go in, there's literally no medicine on the shelves and you get to see it all come together. Yes, it was very cool. cool. I still remember the very first shipment of medicine that we received at that store. Both me and my staff pharmacist, uh, you know, had to open up those boxes, lay them, lay all the medications on the ground so we can figure out which is which. And then we made the floor plan for the pharmacy, basically, what's going to go where. It is so rewarding. I love it. Have you been a pharmacy manager ever since? So that was 2014 that you became the manager? Yes. Yes. I became a pharmacy manager at the first corporation in um, 2012, actually, the end of 2012. Um, And I've been a pharmacy manager with the new corporation since 2014. Nancy, how did you get started with PGX? I had a patient who was struggling with ADHD, trying to find the right medication that would work for him. And his trials and failure is what inspired me to dig deeper into pharmacogenomics, educate myself more, and then open my Texas Pharmacogenomics Consulting LLC. Um, I remember we briefly uh, touched upon pharmacogenomics in pharmacy school back home, but it was not in depth. So I took a certification program and I really enjoyed it. It was hard at first. I'm not going to say it was easy because I've been out of school for so long and it was new, complicated, all those DNAs and codons and exons and, you know, that good stuff. But it was nice. I enjoyed it because I've always been a nerd. So you can leave me with a book for hours and forget I am here. I'll be in my corner studying and reading out loud at times. (laughs) Um, so I got certified in pharmacogenomics, uh, and then I decided to open my own company. Uh, I named it Texas Pharmacogenomics Consulting, LLC. I, um, did that and I registered my company with the state of Texas in September of 2020. Pharmacogenomics is a great path to personalized medicine. All right. And now can you tell me a success story that you've had with your company? Of course. One of my patients was struggling with PTSD. Um, He was kind of a difficult patient to find the right medication for, given that he had history of other health conditions. Um, He had seizure. He was on seizure medication. And he also consumes alcohol heavily. So these two are fatal combination for a lot of mental health medications. Um, His nurse practitioner prescribed an SSRI medication for him. Uh, He comes to me at my Texas Pharmacogenomics Consulting, 
And he says, what do you think? I'm scared to start on this medication because of the other medication that I'm on. And I drink alcohol. Can I still take that medication? I told him, well, let's do the test. We did a simple cheek swab. I sent it to the lab and I received the results. In the meantime, I told him to hold off on his newly prescribed SSRI. And I'm glad I did because the results came back. He was, first of all, a poor metabolizer for the enzyme that was supposed to break down the SSRI and bring it to the right receptors in his body. And it was going to end up accumulating in his body and giving him a fatal effect in combination with the alcohol that he consumes. With the PGX test, we were able to find out the right medication for him. I picked up the phone. I called his nurse practitioner. We discussed it. She was thankful that was a service that I provide. Uh, She said that she didn't know there were pharmacists out there that do that kind of service. And I really appreciated her being open to the idea of PGX and her service because I know a lot of practitioners out there are still reluctant to that since it's a new path and they like to practice medicine certain way. Uh, Me and her, we worked together and we found the right medication for him. And based on his test results too, I kind of recommended some over-the-counter supplements. And those along with the medication helped with his condition. The supplements were based on some deficiencies in certain nutritions that he doesn't have that can... um, lead to him developing a depression or PTSD. Well, it sounds like a success story. And do you continue an ongoing relationship with these patients or is it problem by problem, you fix the problem and then you discharge them? What's that like? I like to have an ongoing relationship with them. I like to follow up and uh, keep up with them and see how they're doing. Uh, Initially, when they start on a new treatment or a new medication action plan that I create, I like to follow up with them weekly. And then we go from there. It's based on the patient preference. Some of them are okay with me following up every week. Some of them would rather me follow up monthly. And some of them don't like me to follow up at all. (laughs) So I do what they prefer. What happens when you do a test on somebody? Do you Do you get a list of all the ones that are definitely going to work and that's how you find the drug? I mean, for anybody listening who might not know about this, can you explain a little bit about what's the process? Of course. So the process that I like to use is just a simple cheek swab. Uh, Certain um, practitioners like to do the blood sample, but it's very painful and it's not necessary. It doesn't give you better results. So a simple cheek swab, you send it to the lab. And then the lab sends you over the results of, you know, that specific person's genes and metabolite status. Uh, You look at the genes and how he is, you know, maybe a rabid metabolizer for such and such or boor metabolizer for, let's, for example, I'm going to, I'm going to pick on CYP2D6 enzyme because it's a, it's a highly polymorphic enzyme. Uh, It interferes with a lot of medications, especially the ones used in ADHD. So uh, it kind of gives you an idea. So it doesn't really tell you, oh, this medication is going to work for them. But we as pharmacists, we use our knowledge from the years that we had in pharmacy school, from our experience, and you just figure out, Okay, so he's a poor metabolizer for this, so I don't think this dosage is going to work for him. Maybe we need to adjust the dosage, or maybe we need to change the uh, the drug class all together. So, and I keep in mind his, you know, patients not only genetic variation, but I also keep in mind other medications that they might be on that might interfere with the efficacy of other medications. Um, Let's say if you're taking a medication that's a pro-drug and it needs to be metabolized to the active metabolite, but then you're taking another medication that's uh, an inhibitor to the enzyme that's supposed to, you know, break down that pro-drug to the active metabolite, you're not going to get an effect. So we have to keep that in mind. I keep that in mind. I keep in mind lifestyle. I keep in mind alcohol consumption. 
a lot of other factors that, you know, contribute to the efficacy of medications and how your body absorbs and metabolizes it. It's like hitting a bullseye, right? It, yes, it is. It's so rewarding. It's, uh, it makes me happy seeing them happy. They found what works for them. Yes. And they can stop throwing money at something that isn't working, right? And having all those extra right. pills around probably too, that's never a good thing. No, it's not. You continue to do this uh, Texas Pharmacogenomics Consulting, LLC. It sounds like you're helping individual patients. Can you tell me, is this something that you do outside of work? So you have your own company, you attract your own clients, or is this something that you do as an intrapreneur with your current employer? I do it outside of work. So when I am off the clock with my current employer, my own gig is a Texas Pharmacogenomics Consulting. Um, I do work with individuals and I do uh, collaborate with physicians and labs. Okay. And how do your patients find you? I have a website. I have social media platforms and um, I just do marketing campaigns. Uh, whether it's on the internet or locally here in town. For anybody listening who would like the website, can you share that with me? Of course. My website is texaspgx.com. Great. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes for anybody that wants to check that out. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, Kim. You're welcome. Now, I think I saw something somewhere on your website where you do coaching as well. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So when I first started doing that pharmacogenomics, I really didn't know where to start. How do I establish a brand new business uh, that is fairly new? There are a lot of... Um, you know, ties to it, a lot of steps that you have to take. So it took some time. I did have a, a good friend that had um, started her own pharmacogenomics prior to me doing it. So she helped me along the way with any questions that I had. And uh, I get a lot of questions from a lot of pharmacists who are trying to create their own pharmacogenomics consulting business. Uh, they don't know where to start, how you know, to get going. So that's where I am able to coach them and um, shed some light on what needs to be done. Um, when I initially started, I wasted a lot of money on a lot of unnecessary tools. So I would like to save them that money and just tell them what really worked for me as far as, you know, Taxes companies, filing companies, website companies, you know, uh, good labs to collaborate with, how to order a lab, uh, how to read a lab report because the report is 34 pages and you can get lost in there. Uh, what information you really need to focus on when you're reading the lab report. Um, how to choose the right lab. How do you select the right lab? And you know, um, know that they're going to give you clear and uh, trustworthy results. I have a couple of follow-up questions, if I may. Of course. The first two are, are your clients all in the state of Texas? And the second question is, are all of these pharmacists that you are coaching on creating their own PGX practices in Texas as well? So patients and pharmacists? No. The beauty of doing pharmacogenomics is you can work it remotely and you can work it outside of state. You don't have to have a certain license to practice pharmacogenomics in a certain state. For example, I have a collaborative agreement with a physician in the state of Arizona. That's different. <laughs> and I have coached uh, some pharmacists who live in the state of New York. Oh, okay. And how about your patients? Are they all in Texas or no? No, I've, I can deal with patients outside of the state of Texas. Um, the lab, I can always have the lab send the sample kit to their home and I can do a Zoom meeting with them to explain how to conduct the swab col collection process 
And um, the symbol comes with instruction sheet on what to do, honestly. It's very self-explanatory, but I'm always there on a Zoom with them, you know, to give them the peace of mind and make them feel comfortable. And um, it comes with a prepaid uh, shipping label. They send it back to the lab and I take it from there. The lab and I communicate and then I pick up the phone and call my patient and tell them about my findings and um, what medication action plan I've created for them based on that. Wow, that really expands, that broadens your patient base by being able to cross the border. That's cool. How did you learn how to do all this? I mean, did you get in touch with your pharmacy board? I know you mentioned you had another pharmacist who kind of mentored you, but I'd love to hear how this all got started. Um, So a lot of it is doing my own research. All the information that you need are really on there on the website of, you know, whichever company you want to research. So let's say the state board, I didn't have to call them. You just go on the state board website and you really find out what the requirements are. Uh, Let's say I want to know if the Texas Medicaid will cover a certain test. You can get on there and find the answers. It could be tricky sometimes. Like you really have to know what you're looking for, or you can always call them up and ask them questions, but we all know how that goes when you call Medicaid or CMS in general. You get put on hold. (laughs) Hello. (laughs) Yes. And good luck getting somebody to answer the phone. And once they answer Mm -hmm. the phone, you don't even know if you're going to get answers. Right. Yeah. How frustrating. Jeez. It is very frustrating uh, for both the uh, practitioner and the patient. Right. Well, you have a little experience being uh, somebody who's passionate about something and you persevere through these obstacles. I know you talked about coming from Cairo to New Jersey, getting licensed, then moving to Texas. When you have a passion for something, Nancy, you follow through. And I think that's a big piece that you can't even teach but you can tell people it's going to be hard and you're going to have obstacles and you just got to stick with it and you're going to make it too, you know, and that's what a coach is good for, right? Of course. Absolutely. I do. I am, um, I was raised to be an independent individual, uh, never give up on things, be persistent, be consistent. If you have a passion for something, you have to pursue it. Uh, Never let anyone or anything get in the way of your passion. Now, it's not going to be easy. I'm not saying it will. It will get hard at times and you'll get frustrated at times, but don't take that as failure. Take that as a learning opportunity for you. Uh, You will have new perspective on things. Uh, Keep pushing and pursuing your passion and you will get the end results and you'll like it. Right. Well, I like how you're a bit of a cheerleader because when things get hard, we all need somebody in our corner saying, oh, that's normal. That happened to me too, because it's really frustrating doing something for the first time. If you can just kind of follow in somebody's footsteps a little bit, it's it's helpful, isn't it? It is helpful. And I wish if I had someone in my corner when I was going through uh, those difficult times when I first started here in the, uh, in the States. Uh, I had no one but my mom in my ear telling me that I can do it. I am capable of doing things and to never give up on my dreams. And I am forever thankful and grateful for such a great mom. Um, And that's what I do for people that I come across, uh, especially my technicians in my um, retail career. Uh, I love to cheer them on. We all go through rough times. Retail is not easy. It's frustrating. It's exhausting. It's draining. Uh, so I like to be there for them because I would love one day for others to be there for me when I need them. Yes. And I hope that they are. Absolutely. All right. Well, now, as if this isn't all enough, I understand you're going to be literally using your voice as a podcast host coming up. What's this all about, Nancy? Tell me about it. So, you know, I'm a passionate person. I can't stop at one station like we talked before. So, (laughs) (laughs) and given that PGX, which PGX 
is uh, the short term for pharmacogenomics is my new passion. I needed to expand that and uh, get my voice out there to um, pharmacists or any clinicians who are interested in learning more about pharmacogenomics. So I joined forces with the Pharmacy Podcast Network, and I will be hosting pharmacogenomics episodes uh, on their PGX for Pharmacists podcast. Congratulations, the next big adventure. That's great. Yes, it's exciting. And um, I hope I can um, create a path for all pharmacists out there to better understand what PGX is and how to implement it and uh, incorporate it in their day-to-day routine or practices. Awesome. I hope you get some engagement from your audience too, because I imagine that they have so many questions with this being something that wasn't necessarily taught. Like you said, when you were going through your program at the University of Cairo, it's something that some people who are graduates from yesteryear, like me, need to learn about after the fact. And I can just imagine them being able to ask you questions. Is that something that you are welcoming as content for your podcast? Of course, uh, we can welcome that. Uh, so far, the podcast is going to be recorded, so they're not going to be a live question and answer, but they can always comment, reach out to me, ask questions, and I'm always happy to answer any questions for them. Uh, maybe in the future, the podcast will be a live podcast for questions and answers. Who knows? Oh, even emails. I mean, I could just see you answering emails on the podcast. That would be so cool, you know? That would be so cool. I am really excited and I hope I can be uh, beneficial to some pharmacists out there. Yeah. Well, good luck with that. That's awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. And I want to bring up the magazine that you were recently featured in. Nancy, you were featured in the spring 2021 issue of Pharmacist Magazine. It's put out by Dr. Jerika Dodd. I buy it every time it comes out. I recommend it to everybody, but I see that you are featured in it. What was that like? It was such a great experience. Jerika is such a great person. I thank God for having crossed path with her. She uh, She's a great advocate for women in pharmacy, and God bless her for that. We women in pharmacy need someone like this in our life. Um, my main reason of being um, agreeing to be featured in the magazine is I wanted to inspire so many foreign graduates out there that are having obstacles in the way of them achieving their American dream of becoming American pharmacists to let them know, do not give up on your dreams. You can do it. Just keep pushing, be consistent. Um, So the experience itself was great. It was new. It was different. Uh, And I am one that I, I've always been competitive. I've never taken no for an answer. Uh, I'm a perfectionist. Oh my goodness. And that is exhausting. (laughs) Everything has to be perfect. Jerika was calming me through the whole process. You need to calm down, take it easy. I love the, um, it was a new experience for me having to get um, my makeup and hair done, getting photographer to take my photo shoot. It was great. It was nice. Uh, I was nervous, but I, like I said, I wanted to inspire pharmacists out there. So, and I'm forever thankful for Jerika for doing that. Yes. Amen. Jerika does a great job. Woo-hoo, and- Jerika! <laughs> Shout out to Dr. Jerika Dodd. And In there, you know, I talk about using your voice and a lot of people think that means literally using your mouth to talk, but you get to use your voice in print to share your story. And I think that's pretty cool. So I commend you on being featured in this magazine and sharing your story. I mean, you are doing exactly what you set out to do. You're trying to inspire foreign pharmacy grads who want to become U.S. pharmacists. So way to go. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I appreciate for Jerika for believing in me and uh, believing that my story is a good story to be put out there for all pharmacists to read. 
Before I let you go, Nancy, there's something that I want to talk about. You and I have something in common. We both have our Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy degrees. We don't have PharmDs. Often, we are underestimated, and it's nothing against PharmDs, not at all. But there is a little bit of a stigma that we have been grandfathered into practicing the same pharmacy that the PharmDs now practice. So this is nothing against PharmDs or anything, but I just want to point out that you and I both have Bachelor of Science degrees, and I think we're doing some pretty amazing things. I completely agree, Kim. I think we are more than qualified to do what we're doing. I think what defines us as pharmacists is our passion and our skills and not our degree. I would agree with that. (laughs) Yes. And for everybody out there who is wondering, you know, how can anybody underestimate anyone else? I just want to invite you, Nancy, to share a story of a time when you were underestimated. Oh, man, there are a lot of those stories. So let me pick one. I was underestimated when I first came to the States trying to obtain my license as a an American pharmacist. Um, I was often told that I do not qualify for them to hire me because I was a foreign graduate and that they would rather hire their school graduates. Um, I knew deep inside that I was more than qualified to be hired and to work and to show them what value I can bring to their team. Uh, But sadly, they didn't see that in me. Like, you know, from my story, I didn't give up. I kept pushing until I found the employer that believed in me and in my capabilities and uh, my skills. Well, congratulations on your success story. And thank you for sharing your story here on The Pharmacist's Voice. Is there anything else you'd like to share as we wrap this up? The only thing I like to share with all the foreign graduates out there Please do not give up on your dreams. Do not let anybody crush your dreams. Keep pushing. Believe in yourself because I will tell you what, if you don't believe in yourself, nobody else will. Excellent point. Well made. And thank you again, Nancy, for being on the Pharmacist Voice podcast. I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Thank you so much, Kim, for having me on here and giving me this opportunity to talk and hopefully inspire some pharmacists out there. And you have a great weekend yourself. Thank you. I'd like to share a few final thoughts with you. If you liked this episode and you haven't listened to episode 97 of the Pharmacist Voice podcast yet, you might like that episode too. Nancy's interview today was a follow-up from episode 97, my interview with Maureen Garrity from NABP. She's the Competency Assessment Director. She talked about how foreign pharmacy graduates can become U.S. pharmacists. And my final thought is that Nancy is a light for others to see. She gives inspiration, and she has grit. Nancy's passion for achieving her goal of becoming a U.S. pharmacist and her perseverance over six long years to achieve that goal is inspiring. If you have a goal, even if it isn't becoming a U.S. pharmacist, keep at it like Nancy did. You can be successful too. Thank you for listening to episode 105 of the Pharmacist Voice podcast. If you liked this episode, share it with a friend. Take a screenshot and post it to social media or send the link to a friend. This podcast is free. So please subscribe and get each new episode delivered to your favorite podcast app each Friday. Remember to check out the show notes. You'll find links to Nancy's LinkedIn profile, website, upcoming podcast, highlights from the interview, and more in those show notes. Enjoy. Enjoy.